A Wall Street Journal correspondent for two decades, Neil King Jr. has reported from more than 50 countries and was part of a Wall Street Journal team that earned a Pulitzer Prize for its 9-11 coverage. He is also the founder of Gotham Canoe, an online journal dedicated to exploring nature and near nearby wilderness. His new book, American Ramble, follows his 330-mile walk from Washington, D.C. to New York City. This evening, he'll be joined in conversation with Signe Wilkinson, a widely syndicated cartoonist formerly based at the Philadelphia Inquirer and the first woman to win the Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning. Please welcome our guest to the Free Library. Hello. All of you have taken time out of mayoral candidate forums to come here. We are very honored, and thank you for coming. Um, I had uh, the chance to meet our esteemed author by kind of by accident, and um, was lucky to have done so because it, his book is terrific. And I am really honored to be here to uh, talk with him about it and with you. Um, but let's just get into quizzing him. <laughs> <laughs> he was a meek, mild-mannered reporter and uh, researcher uh, stuck in COVID, um, doing all sorts of things. But Neil, what was your like eureka moment when you decided that you found what you wanted to do with um, the next year of your life. Right. Well, um, first of all, I just have to say the entire reason I walked from my house in Washington to New York was to be here. <laughs> this is another arrival point. Um, you know, I live on Washington, Capitol Hill, Washington, D.C., nine blocks east of the U.S. Capitol. Um, I've been there for 24 years, astonishingly. And one day, a few years ago, probably five or six years ago, I, it really just crossed my mind. This was not a book idea. I was like, wow, I wonder if what would it be like if I walked out my door and tried to just get to New York as a pedestrian? What would that experience be like? How would a pedestrian fit into that environment? And the, the idea stuck in my mind and germinated, and um, I, I then devised a very elaborate plan, um, complete with all the station stops and exactly what I wanted to do, um, that I was going to walk out my door March 29th of 2020, which, as you know, something <laughs> got in the way in March and made that basically illegal or impossible. And so I put it off for a year. But at that point, um, I had really firmly understood that the idea of walking between these two places was to walk through a good portion of our collective history across a lot of the ground where um, our stories could be seen and deciphered. Um, and I picked a route that basically um, was to take me across that, that the, kind of the best of the story. And it's no um, fluke that I'm here because it did dawn on me because Pennsylvanians might like to know that I had at least briefly considered what would be the most direct route of sorts, which would be to go across the Chesapeake, across, and then to Jersey, and like up the Jersey Shore, and then I was like, no, the, you know, the ocean to the right of me and the, to the New Jersey to the left of me was not going to make for an interesting walk. And it became very obvious that if you're going to make a walk like this, you've got to go through the state where the greatest, the state that was in every way an experiment, that, you know, everything from the outset of it was, let's bring all these people here and see what we can make of this place. And my decision to walk up the route I took that meant that three quarters or more of the book is about Pennsylvania was a, a wise decision. Um, I, it puts me in mind of the Simon and Garfunkel lyrics, all gone to search for America. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. It was a bit of that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And um, how did you, um, it, do you want to read a little bit about how you prepared? Because I think it, from the stories you told, you that's what you were looking for. As, uh, 
Yeah. You know, uh, we're just going to intersperse. This is not a reading, but I am going to read a few things just because I think it helps to kind of get a feel for the narrator, which happens to be me. Truth is, there was no concise encapsulation for the purpose of this walk. One could summon Buddha or Wordsworth or Thoreau's humble paddling on the Concord and Merrimack rivers. One could note that Thoreau never once paused to explain the purpose of his paddle that later became his first gem of a book, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. All that the Concord River contained, the occasional logs and stems of trees, the shining pebbles, the floating cranberries, were objects of singular interest to me, he wrote, and I at last resolved to launch myself on its bosom and float whither it would bear me, to which I said, precisely. My intent, like his, was to take a singular interest in all I encountered, to turn my attention away from the noxious chatter of Washington, the tribal feuding on television and computer screens, and care only for the particularities I found along the way, to shrink my horizons to that of a walking man, and to root my views of the world in what I encountered step by step, to honor and respect what I saw. Attention, the late poet Mary Oliver wrote, is the beginning of devotion. Just to pause for that for a second, the, there was a frame of mind that I built for myself in a way, which was one essentially of a kind of devotion. And to quote another poet, there's an Irish poet, mystic, not no longer alive, John O'Donohue, who had a great line where he said that any of us are all the wiser if we can step out our door on any given day with an open heart and a watchful reverence. And the phrase watchful reverence is one that really stuck in my mind because that was very much the way I walked out my door. I gave myself the freedom, which I think we all have the power to grant ourselves, to be astonished and amazed by things as if I had never seen them before. Yes, I was walking across a very familiar landscape, one that we think we've crossed a thousand times, particularly if you're jetting up and down I-95 or taking the Acela. Um, that was not going to be my attitude. I wanted to go so that when I countered every river, every dividing line, every micronation, as I described them, I was seeing it as if for the first time. Um, I, you wrote at one point, it's a holy walk, a walk of worship. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was actually, you're jumping ahead because there was a great moment where I um, encountered a guy named Ted outside uh, getting his... I was um, just going to ask you about him, but talk well, about... Well, you're the, quoting Ted. <laughs> <laughs> but talk about the guy you met first yeah. and then talk about Ted. So one of the things that was so interesting, you know, I, I, I went, you know, I took my walk out of Washington. I went to see Abe Lincoln. I took a right-hand turn, walked all the way up Rock Creek, for any of you familiar with Washington, D.C. And, you know, I get out of the Washington exurbs, and um, I think it was on the second day that I encountered this couple that, long story short, uh, we got to talking. They were an older couple. And I was going to be eight or nine days down the road in a village walking through Ephrata, near Ephrata. And they had lost touch with some people. And when they heard I was going there, they said, oh, we know some people there. And I said, well, I'll, but we haven't seen them for years. We don't know how they're doing. And I said, uh, well, I will. Um, look them up, I'll find them, I'll give them your best wishes and find out how they're doing. And they were sort of startled and I said, wow, I, I left my house as like a pilgrim and now I'm a messenger, you know? <laughs> and um, so I, I was like, wow, I'm, I'm already encountering these sort of parables. And later that day, my water had run out and I ran into a guy in this very wealthy exurban area of Baltimore and I asked if he could fill my water bottle and he gave me these very involved directions on how I could find a convenience store like two miles away. And um, it became the parable of the empty water bottle and how he couldn't quite get around to understanding that his water, sorry, his house was brimming with water. <laughs> and later that, no, it was actually the next day, I met this guy, you could say, I guess, the sort of polar opposite, out getting his trash. Um, his name was Ted. 
Um, he was a black guy in this neighbor, this very um, rural neighborhood that was primarily black. And the minute he saw me, he said, where are you going? What are you doing? And I told him where I'd come from, where I was going. And he launched into this fantastic sermon, essentially, where he said, you are out to heal the nation, to tune yourself. Um, and in doing that, you're going to tune the nation. We're out of joint. We need you to do this for us. And I was like, Ted, this is some serious stuff. Like, <laughs> you, you, and then he was the one who said, you're on a holy walk. And I'm like, wow, this is, you're heaping a lot of burden on me. And he was, he was like, I think you can handle it. And then he had said, can I get you a water bottle? And uh, I was like, wow. When he came out from his house, I told him the parable of the empty water bottle, which was the first person I'd ever told that story to. And he, was, he said, see, that's the problem. That's why we need you to do this walk. And do you think we've uh, you healed the two? Oh yeah, yeah, it's all fixed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, those two um, those two stories are like um, about the fractures that needed to be healed, like black and white, rich and poor um, in the in the country. Um, so you you hit on them first day out. Good work. You know the thing was uh, going back to when I was going to go, and then you just think, and it's these are the kind of things that's really really worth pausing over. And this is a short list. I was going to walk out the door March 29th, 2020. In between then and when I did March 29th, 2021, we had COVID. We had all the huge fights over vaccinations. Are they real? Are they not? Where did COVID come from? We had the killing of George Floyd. We had the response to that. We had the riots, the protests. We had the tearing down of statues selectively in many cities of the country. We had the debate about our origins as a country. Are we a good country? Are we a bad one? Is our foundational story a good one or a depressing one? We had an election where a certain faction disputed the facts of that election. We had an insurrection at the Capitol nine blocks from my house that I went to look at that played out. When by, so that by the time I left, I walked by a Capitol that was ringed by high fencing and was still being patrolled by the National Guard with automatic rifles. I mean, it was an unimaginable series of events between those two dates. And I walked out into this changed America with a lot of questions in my head about what the heck's going on and what are we about? And you met Ted and you said, okay, things might not be as bad as I thought. Yeah, well, he, he opened the door to there being some, uh, some healing, let's say. Well, it, um, it reminds me elsewhere, shortly thereafter, you said you started f feeling bolts of beauty. In yeah, the, it's, you know, the, the book, as you'll see, if any of you read it or if any of you have looked at it, it's, a, it's an odd kind of tapestry of uh, travel log. Yeah, it's a walk, about a walk. There's a lot of historical kind of portals that are opened, and I meditate on certain things from our past. And there's a certain amount of me, which I hope is a me that many of you might identify with, of just a person going on an extended walk with the intention of paying attention and not putting a lot of extraneous things in my ears. And um, I, <laughs> I think it was like the third day I found myself in this tavern um, in Reisterstown, Maryland. And I was sitting there. There was a huge storm that had swept in, and it was pouring rain. Um, and I was looking through the window at the rain puddles building in the parking lot, and I ordered some fish tacos and a beer. And for reasons that are a little mysterious and hard to explain, I was just struck by an extraordinary sense of joy. Um, and I think a lot of it was I had simplified my life for this brief span down to the few things I had in my bag. Um, I was out to just do this really quite simple thing, which was to walk between my house and Central Park in New York. I was out, as I said, only to pay attention. And something already on the third day in my spirit was responding to that. And it was a, it, the, and I describe in the book several of these kind of I don't know what we call them, rapturous moments. Um, but they're an interesting thing to explain in a book because I realize um, it's the kind of stuff, we were talking about this earlier, our vocabulary is very replete when it comes to talking about anxiety or depression or darker sides of the emotional spectrum. But I think we're all a little bit more challenged and maybe even a little more timid about describing 
the other side of the equation. And I found it even a little bit difficult to explain why these things were coming to me and even find the right way to explain them adequately. Um, but, and it, later I could read it's, you know, a little bit about kind of one of the main episodes of this, which was when I was almost in New York. But um, to the extent that I have an argument, it's that if you go out and really um, simplify what your life's about and give yourself over to kind of the things that are out there that are simple and particular, um, it makes a big difference. You started out as a Wall Street Journal reporter who is someone who goes out and asks people they don't know questions and tries to synthesize them. What was the difference between what you did then and this? You know, I wasn't, uh, for one, I wasn't in need of delivering a story and I had a very open mind about what it is I wanted to find. I didn't, I certainly didn't have anything resembling a thesis in advance. Um, you know, the methodology, to the extent that there was a methodology, was not that different. And I, the, the fact that I had lived all over the world and had communicated and stopped in people's, you know, front yards of the equivalent over years to speak to people whose language I didn't even share necessarily makes a difference. You know, a lot of, we could discuss the issues of kind of who could do this walk, who would um, feel comfortable doing it, all those are really important questions. Um, I'll just say that when it comes to my disposition for doing it, I was pretty well pre-designed pre for not feeling, you know, out of sorts or out of place in being in a lot of odd places and talking to people of all stripes. So that in itself makes a difference. Um, when you uh, started past your people in Maryland and into the uh, to the lower part of Pennsylvania, you started finding people who were uncovering things. Uh, you found someone named Samantha who was an African-American woman who was looking for graves of her family in graveyards that hadn't been marked and had been let go. Um, and so she was trying to uncover them. And you found um, a man who what found rocks in the middle of the river, Susquehanna, uh, the yeah. Susquehanna River, which, by the way, is the fifth largest river in the oldest, world. Oldest, oldest, oldest. 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 Yeah, well, wait a minute. Yet. You said it was 444 miles long. It's well, I know, but when I in terms of its truly distinguishing characteristic is its age. More okay. Than its, size, yeah. it's ancient. It's yes. on. <laughs> it's on Medicare. <laughs> Any rate, um, so this guy in the middle of the river, or this guy has uncovered rocks in the middle of the Susquehanna River that have old petroglyphs on them, and so you went with him to look at them. I mean, it was all this sort of finding things that you wouldn't have found before, and they you wouldn't have found them if you hadn't done the research ahead of time, right? Yeah. I mean, you had it set up that you were going to see him. In large part, some of those were that way. You know, um, one little thing I might note, because it set a real um, precursor for the walk itself. I think for many of us, um, the COVID year, in particular, kind of the first year, uh, depending on our circumstances, was an incredibly instructive time. And it pushed me into this rural area of Maryland, on the eastern shore of Maryland, where I spent months on end. Um, and I've... I realized when I was there that this is where Frederick Douglass had lived like the f most of the first 16 years of his life. And then I realized in reading his autobiography that one of the most seminal moments in his life when he was 16, he had been sent off to this like ruthless slave um, runner guy right near this place where I was living, like a mile and a half away. And I spent a lot of time doing the research trying to figure out exactly where he had been. He had had this fight that is a very seminal moment in, in, in that period. And I tracked it down and it was just this field. It was just a, essentially a forgotten place. There was no marker. There was nothing. And I, could, I spent a lot of time seeing, did anybody know in the area that this had happened? Did anybody sort of remember through the generations that he had been there? And having done that, I kind of went on the walk like, wow, there's just so much that's buried, that's eroded away, that's just not memorialized. 
And the memory part of the a walk of memory and renewal is in a lot of ways about that. And this experience with Samantha Dorham, this was in York, Pennsylvania. You know, there's a whole ongoing project now to um, renovate, um, rejuvenate a lot of these black cemeteries in particular. Um, you know, there's a whole huge history behind where it was that people were buried and what fashion. And, and the project that she was involved in was so powerful because it was not just a, literally like exhuming graves that had sunk into the earth, but wondering like, wait, who was this person that deserved this headstone of this size? And them as a community realizing that there were this generation or generations of incredibly esteemed, like noteworthy people who had been forgotten by them. And she even then found out that there were like great grandparents or even grandparents of hers that were buried there that she was not aware of. So there was a lot of poking around of attempting to find the people who were the, I started to call them memory keepers, like the people that were bringing back to the fore things that we have somehow lost. Um, a lot of it being against the backdrop of what is our collective story and how are we telling it? It's a big issue at the moment with all the nonsense about what books we can or can't read. And um, I just think it's the finer you go, the deeper you go into these things, the more complex it becomes and the simpler, um, the harder it is to tell a simple story. When, <clears throat> when um, you got to Lancaster, you started uh, in the book talking about Pennsylvania's place as um, a middle ground between the New England patriots and the southern gentry <laughs> and the boring Pennsylvanians in the middle. And yet you came out thinking that there was a lot to it. I mean, starting with, you want, want to read about going to the Mennonite school or, um, or yeah, I, some of the, one of the other sort of anic uh, pieces? Yeah, I, you know, one of the things that I like about this book, I did a lot of work in advance. I had the year between to think about a lot of these things. You know, I, I spent days and days understanding who Mason and Dixon were in order to write about the Mason-Dixon line, why, why, there's, why there even was a Mason and Dixon, why they came together. Um, I don't know if any of you know, but it's a great story that there was a moment in like 1756 or so when Venus transited the sun and it was a great way to try to determine, well, how far away is the sun? So these two guys, Mason and Dixon, who didn't know each other before, were put together and they went all the way to the south, southern part of southern Africa to take measurements. And hence, these two guys are known as an entity. But um, my point is that I, I, I was sort of a naif in a way when I went into a lot of this stuff. So there was an element of education that I had undergone. But in a way that I appreciate now looking back, I was encountering these things with only a certain amount of knowledge, which, which, and when it came to the Pennsylvania part, I hadn't spent tons of time studying the role that Pennsylvania played. I hadn't spent tons of time understanding the story of William Penn and the rest of it. I did before I left, and I certainly have a lot more since then. But it was along the walk that it really kind of dawned on me all the more that if it hadn't been for the Keystone State, in the middle of the six colonies to the north, six to the south, and this kind of, you said middling, but um, almost like cooling off aspect that it provided, that the Quakers provided, that that particular sensibility, and all of these other Anabaptists and others that came because of William Penn, that we would be a markedly different place. And, um, and it was also, you know, a right, I've been in Lancaster County many times before. I know that the Amish and the Mennonites are there. Everyone knows, you know, you see the buggies, you have to get around them if they're going too slow. But to arrive there as a walker and just to kind of think like, wow, this is such an amazing thing. Probably the longest running, ongoing, extant experiment on the American continent of these people who had these forces sweep over them in the early 1500s and were then forced to cross the Atlantic by a series of events and were brought to that very rich agricultural area of Pennsylvania and 
They haven't changed, you know, particularly the Amish have not changed what they're doing by much of anything. And it's just an extraordinary thing to think about and to witness in a slow fashion. I was only there for two and a half, three days, but it led to some pretty extraordinary encounters with, with some people that I, I talk about in the book. But um, anyway, does that answer you your question? you want to just read that part? Well, they, yeah. me into the schoolyard? Yeah, I can do that, yeah. That was actually called a, um, a renewal of your mind because I had this amazing encounter with the um, Mennonite school teacher in this school. And when I asked him about what the Mennonites were about, he told me this like three minute version of what they're about. He said they're about non-resistance and non-conformity. And then he quoted this line that I'd never heard before from St. Paul to the Romans, which became a kind of banner in a way for my walk because it kind of captured an element of it. And the line is, um, do not conform to the world, but transform yourself through a renewal of your mind. And when he said that, I was like, wow, that's such a great, a great motto. Don't let the world form what you're about, but continue to transform yourself through a renewal of your mind, an ongoing process. This is just the way I start that chapter because it kind of goes to the observational aspect. She was standing with her knees slightly bent in a patch of grass and sunlight behind a brick schoolhouse. She was focused on something in the distance and wore a long floral dress that extended to her ankles. She was in her early teens and had a white head covering over a bun of her hair curled neatly in back. I was walking up the road when I saw her and then caught sight of a leather mitt on her left hand and then heard the solid whack of a baseball bat. The way she drifted back and so effortlessly fielded a hard hit fly ball and hurled it back the other way, that and all the rest of it, everything, made me stop in amazement. I knew then that I had stepped through the wardrobe into a magical land. For eight days I had been walking. For eight days I had gone north and then bent my way east and had crossed a large river. It was a Tuesday in early April in the middle of the afternoon and an air of enchantment was taking hold. And what happened is I walked into the back of the schoolhouse and these kids on two different diamonds were playing this just extraordinarily aggressive full out game of softball. And at the end of it, they all came running my way with their teacher. And I talk a lot in the book about belonging and making others feel that they belong in the place they are, which is to say welcoming them. And the teacher, Neil Weaver, the first thing he said after he said, what brought you here? And I said, I'm on this walk. And he said, uh, kids, gather around. Let's hear what Mr. King has to say. And I was just kind of like, wow, you know, to have that be your first response. And then after I talked a little bit, one of the young women stepped forward and she said, Mr. Weaver, what if we were to sing for Mr. King? And they invited me into their schoolhouse and they sang these two incredible hymns to me that were both about the afterlife. And I went back there a week ago and I met with this community, about 200 people came in this church, in the school basement. And they, that time then, there were like 60 kids and they got on the riser and they sang for 20 minutes. It was kind of just me and them basically, mm -hmm. which was also quite extraordinary. Nicely done. Thank you. <laughs> Also in Lancaster, um, you, you uh, cogitate about the t two national figures, James Buchanan and Thaddeus Stevens, and compare them as the yin and yang of America in that one little town. Yeah, I was in Lancaster actually, which is where the, when the book came out, I was in Lancaster and it was in an auditorium like this and there were just an extraordinary number of people. And, um, I, the chapter I wrote about Lancaster, the city itself, was entirely about how I walk into this town. And they were then debating um, who they were going to name the James Buchanan Elementary School about after once they took his name off the name of the school. You know, James Buchanan being the president just before the Civil War. And Thaddeus Stevens being one of the truly great 19th century figures, cantankerous, pretty obnoxious, but he was Lincoln's conscience in many ways. And he was one of the chief forces, if you've ever seen the movie Lincoln, 
who, uh, you know, drove Lincoln to moving forward on the Emancipation Proclamation, who drove Lincoln toward admitting blacks into the military during the Civil War, and then was really one of the founders of the second founding with the amendments after the Civil War. And it was such a fantastic illustration of going to James Buchanan's meticulously kept house that the Junior League had looked after all this time. And only now have they got around to renovating the Thaddeus Stevens townhouse in downtown Lancaster that had been like a drug den and a um, boarding house and a garage and all these things over the decades. And James, sorry, Thaddeus Stevens is about to maybe, if we're lucky, finally have his moment. But my point, and what I wrote about that is, I caution any of us to be careful in how we put ourselves back into history. When any of us think of ourselves in the 1840s or 50s, we think we're stride for stride with, you know, uh, Frederick Douglass and um, William Lloyd Garrison or whomever, when you have to understand that about 4% of the population were in that position. And Thaddeus Stevens himself was an extraordinarily uh, unrepresentative person at that time. And James Buchanan, on the other hand, was actually exceedingly representative of what we were like as a country then. And, I might argue, fairly representative of what a lot of people are now. So um, I, I think it's worth remembering how extraordinary people remain extraordinary, even if they've sort of paved the way for the way we think now. And likewise, we think uh, kindly of William Penn and not being relatively okay with the uh, Native Americans and trying to have a peaceful country. And then we f rem don't remember the Paxton brothers, that you, yeah. whom you men mention. You know, uh, part, part of my, um, again, kind of the liberty I granted was just to pause over these things. And, you know, we all, know, we all kind of know these various things, like what are systematic uh, mistreatment of the indigenous population in America was all about, but it, it it helps to pause over some of them, and I don't know how many of you are aware, I'm sure quite a few of you are, of just this particular incident. And Pennsylvania's history is replete with hundreds and hundreds of these stories, but the Paxton boys one was just a really interesting moment where a bunch of these guys from kind of further up by Harrisburg had decided that they were going to come to this village near Lancaster and just like basically, you know, kill all of the members of the village who had nothing to do with anything that anybody should care about. Um, and they did that even when they then took the survivors to the jail in Lancaster, they went and ransacked the jail and killed those people there. And it became a huge thing. They were then going to march on Philadelphia. Benjamin Franklin wrote a fantastic treatise that I would recommend any of you read that was basically like on the events in Lancaster County. And he makes a really amazing and strong case that the white population was going in a direction that he found disturbing, which was to lose its ability to distinguish between the various feuding tribes, those that were hostile and those that weren't, and was just blanketing all of them under one rubric as people that had to be eliminated. And that's essentially where most people fell, and it was, that ended up being a kind of a turning point in Pennsylvania's history when even the Quaker contingent began to lose its hold over the legislature and a whole different um, group of people began to sort of take over uh, and with a very different attitude toward the frontier and what it meant. Um, <clears throat> you eventually make your way through uh, Valley Forge and uh, talk about that as a, a spiritual place in, in our history. Um, but um, getting you to Philadelphia, you come in from the west, from Valley Forge, and you come in through, on the Lincoln Highway, uh, to West Philadelphia. And if you can find that, that passage where you talk about the transition from West Philadelphia okay. across, he does a lot with bridges, bridges going from one side of um, to another with changes on either side. And this one was particularly vivid when he crossed the Schuylkill River. 
uh, from West Philadelphia to Kelly Drive. It just so happens there are a couple of people here, including you, that are in the book, and Charlie, my friend Charlie Walsh is here, and he was, he's in the book. We're actually walking together at this point. Um, within blocks of Overbrook High School, where the towering Wilt Chamberlain racked up an average of 37.4 points a game during his three seasons there, the neighborhood deteriorated into a tableau of decaying strip malls, collapsing churches, grimy corner stores, garbage piled high in empty lots. You can go look at old America, the taverns and roadhouses and grist mills and churches from long ago, but you find our true decrepitude in patches like this. We flatter ourselves as a young country still, innovative, prosperous, ever renewing, but we excel in the art of selective decay. Any of, uh, ahead of us, the city's downtown towers gleamed with morning sunlight, but here it was hard to detect even the hint of lost youth. Valley Forge now is what it never was before with its meticulously kept make-believe huts and granite monuments, while chunks of West Philadelphia sink into the mire. As we neared the river, we could see where the father, town fathers lavished the love and polish and public investment. Crossing that bridge into Philadelphia proper is to traverse a divide far vaster than the river itself. Fleets of rowers and long skulls left yawning wakes in the river. Along sidewalks dotted with sculptures and statues came a steady stream of runners. We had entered a land of fitness and wealth, another micro-nation along the way. Folks here wanted you to know they were on the move. It was hard to know which side of the river better captured our future. Anyone recognize that city? <laughs> um, the, when he gets over uh, onto that side of the river, he decides to um, go to the one place in Philadelphia where many, many eight, uh, people from the early 1800s came to get a sense of what the new America was all, all about. Anyone know where that might have been? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Did you cheat? <laughs> um, you want to talk a little bit about Eastern Penitentiary? And Eastern, then, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I'll just read this a little bit because it does it pretty well. Philadelphia was truly new, a city unrecognizable from anything on the planet with its rectilinear grid, its numbered streets, its public parks. A Quaker city organized from scratch according to a higher rationality. Philadelphia was doing things in town planning, in medicine and science, in new forms of government and social hierarchy that the curious just had to come examine and assess. The world off it offered nothing more novel than what was happening here. And when the scholars, reformers, novelists, philosophers, adventurers, and preachers arrived, many made a beeline to one place as I was now myself, to the hulking stone walls of the city's eastern state penitentiary. Cherry Hill, as many knew it, was by far the century's star attraction for anyone interested in new forms of imprisonment. And it's really amazing when I think, because I'd come from Valley Forge the day before, and my interest in Valley Forge was really to talk about when we decided to care about that winter of 1777-78. And it wasn't really until more than a century later that the concept of this sort of grit, perseverance, horrible winter, you know, back on our heels, et cetera, became a real thing. But if you leap from 1778 to 1829, when Eastern State opened, we had gone from that in the span of 50 years to the Quakers then opening what became this model of solitary confinement, and we could go on, there are a lot of reasons why there actually was something somewhat humane about solitary confinement if you were to look at Sing Sing and some of these other places that had a different form of imprisonment. But um, I, for anyone who lives in Philadelphia, you're gonna be like, why is he writing at length about Eastern State Penitentiary? But <laughs> it was such a fascinating place to look at the kind of portal that so many people entered during that time. But now, 
and a lot of the book is about kind of measurements of time and how it is that you can go see different aspects of time passing. And the fascinating thing about Eastern State, which I write about also, is that they call it a stabilized ruin. So there are whole portions of it that they're not, they claim that they're not going to touch. So if you go through the death row part and you come out the other side, there are portions of it that are just collapsing and trees are growing and, you know, it's a great, and to me it was a juxtaposition of standing in somebody's cell where somebody might have spent 50 years in solitary confinement looking up through the, the eye of God, as they call that little window to the sky, and that kind of just like endless eternity, and then the speed with which, by a different clock, you know, polonia trees and other kinds of trees that love ruins can reclaim a place like Eastern State, and if you let it go, it won't last long. And that kind of juxtaposition I just found really interesting. Um, speaking of holes in the ceiling, you went from there to? Yeah, well, thanks to Signe who, uh, so just by way, just to back up a little bit, so I, I had a lot of moments of where the kind of whimsy came to me, the serendipity came to me, and when I look at the book now, and some, many of the things that I love about it were delivered to me by people who popped up as, you know, guides to that place. And Signe, Intruders on your life? <laughs> hardly. And Signe was one of them. And so she was the one who proposed, and I call the chapter about Philadelphia the eyes of God because of the whole eyes of God concept at the Eastern State Penitentiary. And then when I was departing Philadelphia a day or so later, she took me to the Chestnut Hill Quaker Meeting House where James Terrell has built this um, skyscape, and if, none, if, if you haven't gone there, you should. It's extraordinary. Um, and we've talked a lot in the last few days about James Terrell because he's such an interesting person, and a lot of sort of his take on things I've come to absorb in my, in my own right. But there, unlike in the penitentiary, we're in this you know, um, religious place, and he's created this opening in the sky, and through the shifts in light, you lay on the floor. You know, I should maybe even read a couple of those things because it was, um, and at the end of, you know, you, it's sunset and Terrell, of course he's not there, but they have arranged all these sort of subtle shifts in the light which dramatically change the look of the sky. And at the end, um, when the lights come up, I think it was Signe said, uh, any questions? And I laughed, there were, 12 or 15 of us there, I said, I have only questions. And then I write, we had stretched ourselves out in a house of worship for a lesson in doubt and profound relativism. What we saw outside had everything to do with the prism through which we saw it. The color of the near altered the color of the far. It was all one vast interplay. You could come away perplexed, your certitude challenged, or you could come away soothed, gladdened by the complexity. And, you know, Terrell has a fascinating I, thesis, I guess it would be, which is in a perceptual manner, there is no reality per se. It's a something that we create when we walk into it. Um, that this, the, and it, it is created in part by the frame that we bring with to it. Um, and, of course, in a lot of ways he's talking about in very literal sense. But I also think that there's much to be said for that in a more um, symbolic sort of way that, I don't know, just to pause for a second, if you think of these two incredible events that have occurred over the last couple of days where in Kansas City a kid goes to someone's door thinking it's his brother, his brother is there with friends, rings the doorbell, and a guy shoots him through the door immediately seeing this person as a threat. Or the story of the woman and her friends that drives up the wrong driveway, and the guy comes out of his drive and just shoots them in their car. And if ever there was a frame that's pretty disturbingly horrific, it's that frame of just instantaneous fear based on what? Nothing, really. But it's, it's, it's a frame that an extraordinary number of people seem to live with. And, um, in these two instances, quite a disturbing one. But it's something you, anyway, I don't want to go on the soapbox, but 
Well, I do, I do have a little story about <clears throat> Terrell when he was working on the uh, the meeting house. He was also, uh, people were talking about him doing uh, another project somewhere in Philadelphia. And he went and looked at Eastern State Penitentiary and looked in through the cell and he said, I can't do it. It is just too upsetting um, because he had spent time in federal prison in Kansas for bad draft counseling, as he called it. Um, and he has a wonderful story. He said, you know, I, everyone was trying to get me out. The, um, uh, my uh, religious friends prayed for me. My Quaker friends vigiled, vigiled for me. And my Jewish friends found a really good lawyer and got me out. <laughs> but it, he was just, he just, and this is, this is 40, 50 years later, but he just couldn't deal with, um, with uh, the prison. But uh, it, you didn't stop in Chestnut Hill, you kept going. Uh, yeah, it, I, it was at that point that I took a bit of a divergence because I was very intent on paying homage of sorts to two individuals who were worth going out of your way for. One was Benjamin Lay. So I walked up to Abington and um, went to the place where he's very humbly buried and has only recently received an actual named gravestone. And there's a whole great story behind that. Again, I'm sure a lot of you in this room are familiar with Benjamin Lay, but of all the colonials, he was perhaps the most just overtly obnoxious and a truly radical abolitionist at a time when um, there were exceedingly few people in that camp, even among the Quakers. And he was one of the great forces at all of like four foot two hunchback, um, pushing the Quakers just themselves to renounce slavery. And he was such an incredibly interesting person because way before the boycott, boycott became a thing, he refused to use sugar, drink tea, coffee, be around tobacco, all of the things which were, there, were themselves the, the fruit of slave, enslaved labor. And what was fascinating about Benjamin Lay there was it was only in like four or five years before I arrived there that the meeting house in Abington had kind of come around to remembering that he had been part of their fold and that they had actually essentially excommunicated him. And they had sort of brought him back as a person of standing and there's now a marker outside on the road. And, he is, you know, of all Philadelphians, he was certainly among the most extraordinary. And then I went up to Doylestown because I really wanted to kind of meditate and ponder over the whole Henry Chapman Mercer story. Some of you are, I'm sure, familiar with the Mercer Museum, but one of the things, you know, I may just read a tiny bit about because I, Mercer, when we're thinking about, you know, the founders and, and that whole question, I, I just love the way Mercer went about this um, because, you know, his whole view. So this is the start of this one chapter. Who were the founders? Who built the foundations of our early republic? Who made the country possible? Without whom, let's say, could it not have happened at all? You think about who did the original spade work when you walk the roads, the rail beds, the canal towpaths, when you cross the expansive bridges over the biggest rivers or the small but elegant bridges over mere creeks. You think of who built what while admiring the barns, the stone houses, the tumble down grist mills, the fields under plow that someone cleared of trees, and then of the stones turned into walls that snake beside the roads you walk. I have stood to admire such walks, so such walls, just trying to imagine the exertion it took to build them. We have founders who wrote declarations, who helped conceive of constitutions or offered amendments, who trafficked in ideas and gave speeches on liberty or death, founders who put their looping signatures at the bottom of solemn documents. We give primacy to such thinkers in part because it's the thinkers who have the power to grant primacy. They are the ones in the framed portraits, on the covers of books, or peering from our currency, in part 
because the portrait painters, the bookmakers, and the printers of currency had the power to put them there. I was walking up Doyle's to Doylestown, up Lime Kiln Road, not to diminish those founders, but to look at the works of a man who obsessed over other founders, the makers and builders, the users of tools. And that was what Henry Mercer was all about. Nice. <laughs> Um, I think we're getting ready for uh, questions, but do you want to just, you have uh, a bit on the bridge coming into New York that you might want to Yeah, I'll just read this one really quick bit of it. So at the end, I have this chapter called The Rapture on the Bayonne Bridge, and I'm walking up, anyone who lives in that area will be like, what? How could you have a rapture on the Bayonne Bridge? Um, I was walking from Staten Island up, this is an extraordinary bridge built in the 30s, to Bayonne, because I wanted to get into Manhattan the way that the old timers had, they hadn't gone through the swampy areas of New Jersey. Um, um, wait a minute, let's just make sure that I'm in the right place here. Okay, so I'm coming up the incline and I'm astonished by the sight of Manhattan. It had just sort of swamped my, it had overcome me. I cut my head in my hands, or so it might have looked like, so it might have looked like sobs but was instead a weird form of laughter. A bike rider who zipped past might have thought I was distraught and planning to jump. I just sat in the sunlight by a concrete barrier, buffeted by the wind, and looked at the city overcome. The Quakers might have said that I quaked, the shakers that I shook. I heaved with a bodily joy. My delight sprang in part from the satisfaction of nearing the end of a long pilgrimage. It may have been tinged even by some fleck of regret that, I was nearly, that it was nearly over. This weird rapture, though, went beyond mere gratification. I had seen this skyline before. A thousand times over the years, I had caught sight of it from all directions as a cab driver and a common traveler. But on this morning, the sight of it physically astonished and stunned me. The days and all those steps had pried open a part of the human spirit that magnifies the potency of otherwise simple things and grants the commonplace a touch of the divine. Not bad. You're probably saying, are you okay? <laughs> Um, wanted to know how many times did people offer you rides and also if you were ever stopped by police if not do you think it had to do with your race and that was the reason why you may not have been harassed yeah good questions once a guy pulled over on the third day and said do I want a ride and I said no thanks I didn't know why he was offering the ride um, I'm sure just goodness and I didn't need a ride. Um, uh, no, I was never hassled by police. Um, you know, I talk about that subject a lot, um, the kind of belonging thing and the suspicion. And um, I, I would never for even a remote second uh, act as if, I mean, I'm, as I described before, good at this. Um, I'm, I don't conjure up a lot of suspicion just because of the way I come across. I'm the age I am, I'm the skin color I am. Those things make a, you know, first impressions go a long way. Um, on the other hand, and I, I, it's a hard line to draw. I, I acknowledge absolutely that it would be a, a riskier walk for other people, women, black men, all kinds of other people. But I, I would not myself say, therefore that person shouldn't do it. I think. Um, that if, the, if a person was predisposed to wanting to do it, they would probably have a certain amount of the skills that would allow them to do it. And again, going back to the Terrell sort of thing, um, I, I, I just am hesitant to posit like an automatic ambient sense of danger that's just there, um, while not diminishing the fact that the risks are higher. And there are stories, there was just a story the other day of a young black man who's repeatedly done the Appalachian Trail on his own, has 
hiked thousands of miles, actually I think it was more like hundreds of thousands of miles around the United States. Um, so, yeah, but anyway, it's, I think it's a totally valid question. Um, so just um, in terms of, and I've not read the book yet, but look to, forward to, um, in terms of revelations, both positive and then on the other hand, you know, negative, what, what would those be? Yeah. You know, this again is also sort of hard line to draw. I'm not, the more now that I'm two years distant from it, it's the book, there's nothing in the book that is remotely fictional. Everything is completely accurate to what happened and to how I responded and felt. And yet, in some ways, looking back on it, I see it almost as a bit of, as almost a sort of fantasy, not as a, not in a bad way, but in part because of the frame of mind that I had, which I think I could recreate, I, I walked through a landscape um, and saw a version of America that I think is extremely valid. And I think I would really urge any of us to sort of get a glimpse of what it is I'm talking about because um, we create our own vision of where the country is based on these things that are being presented to us on television or in the papers. I'm not saying they're not real, but they're exceedingly selective. And part of my exercise was, okay, I'm not going to have those things. I'm just going to go out and look at the world for a month and just pay attention to the thing in front of me. And there's just a very, very different place. And, you know, I also saw a spring unfold that I've never watched close before. And that in itself was really quite extraordinary. But, you know, I, lately I felt, you know, reading the news about these people being shot for idiotic reasons and a lot of other things that are going on right now, I feel myself kind of being sucked into that place again where it's like, therefore, the country's like this. And, and yes, there are aspects of it that are like that. Um, but I think maybe in a way I'll always have this thing saying, oh, yeah, but. And that other thing I saw throughout that period and the place that it sort of brought me is, is I think, equally valid. Um, but, you know, when it comes to the figuring out what we are and the thing that makes me so kind of appalled by some of this simple-minded stuff that certain unnamed governors are trying to do in terms of imposing what anyone considers to be the sanctified understanding of who we are as a country is, like, have, I'd love to have anybody in the room tell me that they fully and absolutely understand their spouse, you know, <laughs> much less the friggin', you know, essence of our country or what we're all about. I mean, it's just like, and the one thing I write about in there is you only, if you think about it, you only actually feel shame for your own country. I don't feel shame for France or Germany or Russia, you know. I feel shame for a lot of things we've done, but I also think that it's deepened my sense of love and understanding for this place, right? It's an extremely complicated story. There are a lot of things that are dark. There are many, many things that are uplifting about it. And if you don't have the full understanding, then you're not doing it justice, right? And you're diminishing the whole of it. And it's pretty hard to get a full understanding of this, <laughs> this yeah, country. Yeah, it ain't possible. <laughs> In the back. Uh, yeah, I very much, I don't, I don't know if I'll do a, a book that's sort of, I'm not like going to set off from Central Park and walk to Boston and do a part two. Um, but I am, I do think there's a lot of merit in um, up close observational kind of deciphering along the lines of what this book is. And, and you know, I could go on and I know we don't have the time and do talk about other writers that have done things that are faintly similar. I'm often astonished when I read really good books of history and I realize that the writer never went to the places themselves, you know, mm -hmm. as if you can write history by just, you know, going through all the records at the Library of Congress or, you know, here at the whatever archives. Like, that just is strange um, to me. My, my current interest is very focused, oddly enough, on the history of the kind of trans-Allegheny movement of when we went into the Ohio River, for instance, and I'm really, really fascinated by all the remnants of the really early, early people um, that left behind these effigy mounds and other kinds of incredible structures that a lot of us aren't even aware, Pier, you know, something that resembling pyramids, these mounds and like, and kind of trying to do a, a like a kind of archaeology of modern America that would be based on either canoeing and walking, but, but again, from a slow uh, point of view. So I'll... We'll be looking forward to that. 
<laughs> wow, I, that's great. I appreciate that. Well, it's so great to be here to, tonight and to, um, like I said, and I wasn't really joking, this was not just a destination but an aspiration to write a book that would bring me to this place and uh, to talk to you all about it. So I'm, I'm happy for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm.